Guys, you remember this classroom? Look at it now. Look at this shit. I go away for the summer and they fix my sound room. That's what I'm talking about. Look at these floors. Except they took all the desks out, so now I gotta sit in the teacher's chairs. You know what? what? Oh, I thought that was a piece of bread. Uh, let's do it. It's the middle of July. Independence Day was just about three weeks ago, but you would think that Independence Day was Independence Month, considering that people are still setting off goddamn fireworks in my neighborhood. Look, I'll play fireworks or gunshots for a week, but three weeks is goddamn pushing it, Brooklyn. What else is going on? Um, oh, uh, NEMM 18 happened. That's pretty dope. I've uh, been looking for a new bike for the last few weeks. You no know, stepping outside of my comfort zone a little bit. One of the ways that I did that was that I was actually considering buying a Buell. An XB12 to be exact, a big boy. And why wouldn't I consider it? I just came from a big twin bike and I also witnessed one of my boys kill it on one of the several Buells that he owns. And the XB12 in question had a real nice price tag for a fabulous condition example. The salesman nearly sold me on a bike as it was super clean, cheap, and as cool and unique as any Buell is. Ultimately, no, I, I didn't purchase the Buell, but well, I guess that's technically another sort of clue, huh? Like, like no, my secret new bike isn't a Buell, but as far as I can tell, ain't nobody was even guessing in that anyway. But you know what? In unison with the lingering patriotism of July, it got me thinking and researching the unusual and rather unsteady American brand of motorcycles. Who exactly is Eric Buell? And what's the origin of deciding to put Harley motors in super advanced chassis? And why is every Buell bike so extremely innovative? What ultimately made the brand go belly up several times? It's no secret that America isn't exactly known for its super advanced sport bikes that leave Japan and Europe running away with their exhaust pipes tucked between their subframes. But I'd say we should take a look at the man in a brand who came the closest to changing that. Cause this, this is the rise and fall of Buell motorcycles. So who is Eric Buell? Eric Buell, born in the year 1950 in Pennsylvania, had began to manifest his love for tinkering and motorcycles at a very young age. In that sense, he kind of reminds me of me. I always had a love for understanding how things worked and building things in general, and I guess the motorcycle thing is fairly self-explanatory in it. Eric was actually an MX racer early on prior to becoming a road racer on the side. At the time, he was riding bikes built by major manufacturers on a track. Eric was the definition of busy as not only did he race bikes, but his income came from being a motorcycle mechanic and his knowledge of engineering came from classes at the University of Pittsburgh at night. He then graduated in 1979 and he was determined to put his new degree and life experience to use and that led to him landing a job with Harley Davidson in Milwaukee. Eric was an extremely valuable asset to Harley Davidson as he had extensive engineering knowledge, but he also had experience with application considering his racing background. Now here's where things get highly interesting, especially for his folks who don't have extensive knowledge of Harley's. See, Harley was more or less stagnant for a while, but in 1976, three years before Eric graduated, Harley had begun its most ambitious project ever at the time, and probably even since then. I just researched the hell out of this project, right? And <laughs> I swear it's fascinating as hell to me. All right, I'll, I'll try not to ramble on too long about this part. Enter Project Nova. What was Project Nova? Well, it's only a huge indicator of what HD is totally capable of doing if they actually tried. It was basically an extremely smart response on the part of Harley Davidson to the influx of very complex and advanced Japanese and European standard touring and cruiser bikes flooding American shores from the likes of Honda, BMW, Yamaha, etc. To start the project, a very unexpected collaboration with Porsche was formed to combine German engineering prowess with American style and ideas. The main focus of the project, obviously, was to be the creation of engines that would not only blow any Harley out of the fucking water at the time, but also the competition as well. So Harley had roughly three engines in mind. A small displacement V-twin, a 1000cc V4, and a V6 displacing uh, well over a liter. To create three engines within the same line would also allow for shared parts, which would allow for interchangeability and easier production. Now, the V4 in the late 70s would have been rare enough, and the V6 would have just been straight up mind-boggling. But the more impressive part is the amount of tech and engineering that Harley had planned to put into these bikes. Counterbalances, short strokes for high RPMs that really weren't present on typical Harley. Four valves, dual overhead cams, liquid cooling, shaft drive, even though that was actually ditched for a belt later. Fuel injection, and that's not even counting the chassis that these engines will go into. My first thought when I looked at one of these bikes is, how is this 
liquid cooled. There's no radiator, and it's the telltale cooling fins of an air cooled bike. The thing is, HD was very clever at how they wanted to present the Nova package. See, they placed the radiator, well, I should say they hid the radiator under the seat, and they laid it flat with inlets to cool the engine. Cooling fins were entirely unnecessary, but HD wanted to cater to his audience concerned with tradition and appearing conservative when it came to the newfangled technology. Oh, I should mention that the gas tank actually wasn't a gas tank either. That would hold the airbox, the electronics, and a couple fans. The gas tank was actually under the seat towards the back, and you can even see the fuel filler cap back there. The dash gauges and lights would be as advanced as the late 70s would allow, but the frame would use the engine as a stressed member to eliminate down tubes. And yeah, that's standard for most of today's bikes, but back then it was rare and impressive. Hell, even if you look at the 2018 lineup for HD bikes, you'll see down tubes on every single bike listed. Harley Davidson has spent over 10 million in research and development on this new line of bikes, and this is prior to full production, as by the early 80s, only about two dozen running engines were built, the varying cylinder counts, and about half as many bikes were completed. The middle ground V4 was a hit among those who were lucky enough to actually test ride the Novas. But the unfortunate reality is that none of these bikes actually made it to any dealers. The whole project was dropped. In the early 80s, HD had experienced a change in ownership and leads. The Nova project was already a questionable oddball experiment, and faith in the typical HD customer base to actually accept these new advanced bikes quickly died as the complexity of the project grew and more money was put into it. Those of you who know your Harleys also know that this was around the time that HD was also working on its new Evo engine platform, which really was much more aligned with the HD image and ethos. Really, when it came to monetary gain, the choice for which project to kill was a very obvious choice for the higher ups at HD. All right, all right, let's uh, let's wrap up this Nova business so I can get back to the man of the hour. I just, I just want you to think of one thing though, as a brief aside. Imagine, imagine if Harley, Harley beat Honda to the V4 game. Imagine how crazy it would have been if the V4, and a high-tech one at that, would have become synonymous with not Honda, but with Harley Davidson. Because remember, this, this is prior to any of the Honda VF bikes, where Honda basically blew its V4 load all over its dealerships. And then imagine the liquid-cooled advanced Nova twin engine alongside the traditional Evo twin engine, not to mention the largely innovative V6 engine and its lack of basically any competition. I mean, imagine if Harley would have normalized the V6 bikes. Unfortunately, focus solely on the bottom line and pleasing its usual customer base, Harley killed the Nova. And you'll find that this will become a trend through the years, so <laughs> don't forget this. So did any of the R&D that HD had completed for the Nova to make it to the road actually get to the road in at least any other form? Well, a few things here and there, like the DNA of the Nova showed up in a few bikes. Main the main result was the liquid-cooled dual overhead cam modern V-Rod, but that came out a full 20 years after the fact. Hop aboard the V-Rod, and once you've got over the incredibly low seat height and the vast length of the thing, you're going to find yourself slipping into cruiser mode in no time at all. You know the deal, feet up in the breeze, 4,000 revs on the taco, and feeling like you're Peter Fonda out of Easy Rider. However, this is only half of the story with this Harley, because it revs to 10,000 RPM, very high for a cruiser. Pin that throttle, hang on, and I challenge you not to laugh, because this bike is indecently fast for something so fat. In fact, away from the traffic lights, it charges like a rampaging bull walrus on heat. This is a Harley that could actually land you in hot water with the law. Well, I never. And you'll often find that the old school Harley guys shit on his bike as a false Harley. So I guess that this bike is a real fake bike? I don't know, like, we got a fake Harley. Your Harley's a real bike, I don't know how that works. Naturally, such an innovative and engineering intensive project would have the likes of Eric Buell working on it. Even though the program was ultimately axed, Eric had placed some of the technology that he had pioneered, such as chassis improvements to improve stability and handling onto bikes like the FXR, a bike that's widely regarded as one of the best handling Harley cruisers out there, as well as the smoothest with its rubber motor mounts. He was still racing in his spare time. In fact, Eric took a gamble and stood out from the crowd by purchasing engines and bikes from an extremely obscure manufacturer from England called Barton. It seems that Buell had respect for the little guys who were trying to get a foothold among the greats. <laughs> Perhaps he felt that way from his own experience. Now this was a noble idea on paper to attach your name to a lesser known builder, but yeah, uh, turns out Barton was kinda shite when it came to building race engines, let alone entire bikes. Okay look, uh, Buell bought a limited production race bike that Barton had built. It was powered by a 750cc two-stroke engine, and the thing was pretty much a turd. It was made with shite materials. It was put together poorly with said shite materials. The motor was about as reliable as ice on a hot day, and the chassis was an unbalanced mess. But remember who we're talking about here. This is engineering pro Eric Buell, 
So instead of dropping Barton like any reasonable person would, he went in and fixed all the shitness himself. He re-engineered parts of the engine that failed to increase reliability and also ended up boosting performance too. Was what we were doing things on, and obviously going outside to places around Milwaukee to get things made for me. What funded the business was making parts for race bikes. Um, I was a U.S. distributor for Dymag wheels, uh, for uh, Lockheed brake calipers and systems. Uh, Interstate leathers, a whole bunch of things I was importing out of England. He didn't bother with the frame though, as apparently it was better suited to just be thrown in the dumpster. So what did Buell have on his hands now? He had an incredibly powerful bike that uh, would still break, but at least it would haul ass while it turned its internals into 60 grit dust. He named this monstrosity the RW750, Road Warrior 750cc. It doesn't get more 80s than that, folks. <laughs> anyway, uh, I know it's called the Road Warrior, but that's in reference to the road racing, not the literal street. <laughs> Square 4 rotary valve. Square 4 rotary valve, 750cc. This made 165 horsepower at the output shaft of the transmission. This made up, this weighed 304 pounds. Now, this is a fast motorcycle. It had a lot more horsepower than a TC750, and it was about 40 pounds lighter than a TC750. Well, maybe not a cab, but he had a pretty cool part for it. This bike topped out at an impressive 180 miles per hour and was run by Eric in the AMA Formula 1 race class. And this is not to be confused with F1 where they race those angry triangles that sound like hair dryers. In 1982, Barton went kaput and offered Buell the option to buy out their leftover stock, intellectual property, and even the rights to sell and build whatever he wanted from their stock and blueprints. Combine this with Buell's newfound expertise on Barton engines and the fact that he broke one, re-engineered it, raced it, and broke it again and would now basically know how to perfect them the second time around, it really was a no-brainer for him to accept the deal. The unfortunate part though is that he didn't really have enough time to develop and sell the RW bikes for the upcoming 1983 season, which, you know what, fine, maybe next year. So that year, he spent all his time working on the Barton motors, trying to perfect them tirelessly, using his knowledge to try to justify his investment and create something that the world would actually want. In the end, it was just more money and help that Eric really needed, so who better to turn to than his own employer? He presented the idea of Harley attaching their name to a sport bike project that he would pretty much lead as long as they could just throw a few dollars his way. An investment on Harley's part, basically. Harley said, Piss off, you bastard. I don't know why Harley would have that accent, but whatever. And anyway, they weren't down with the idea, unfortunately. At that point, Eric decided that it was time to leave Harley Davidson and focus on his own goals. And that was funding the business after I left Harley in 83 and came here. That and then hopes of the RW750 being, you know, a great moneymaker, which <laughs> yeah, it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> these are RW750 uh, cases. There's a whole pile of parts, even some new stuff, but unfortunately, some of the, they're in a barn and in a uh, grain granary that's buried under hay. And because uh, I rent in a barn to a farmer who needed some I can't get to. I wish I had more pieces to show you. Because I've got, I actually have 17 sets of crankcases. Well, I was ready to go. <laughs> so we found some used ones that had been run and stuff, so you can see. It was a square four, two stroke rotary valve, Insane. six speed transmission. Um, that is one of the RWs. The other one is in the um, uh, lobby. And it's usually in my office, but we moved it to the lobby. So 84 rolls around and he had built several examples of the RW750 that he had run himself a couple years prior. He improved the basic reliability of the bike and was ready to sell them, and for dirt cheap too, at just $17,000, which to put into perspective was about half as much as the race bikes that the big Japanese guys were selling at the time. One racing team eventually actually bought the RW750, the first ever sold and the second ever raced if you count Eric's original. They loved the bike and they raced it for the 1984 season. And you can imagine how hyped this would be for Eric, a young rising engineer who is now actually getting the publicity that he actually needed. Now, yeah, let's see who wants an RW for the 1985 season. Yeah, sound, sounds good, right? Yeah, then it, then it went to shit. It li went to literal shit. It, the worst thing possible happened. Long story short, the Formula One class was killed off in favor of Superbike. Yep, <laughs> just like that, literally all of Eric's stock was practically useless. He had virtually no market for his bikes because the league in which the bike was made for no longer existed. What wound up happening was that AMA uh, eliminated the Formula One class. Actually, in the time period between when Kevin and whoever else were doing an article, it wound up uh, on the cover of the Cycle magazine, the uh, RW. And uh, from the time they got started doing the story to where the, where the magazine published, which is like three months or four months, the AMA had announced that that was the last year for Formula One, so I'm 
sitting there looking at the cover of the magazine <laughs> saying, with tears practically running down my face. <laughs> Now here's where things start getting pretty cool and uh, easier to find sources and images for. <clears throat> Buell more than likely just liquidated a big chunk of his Barton based RW750 stock for fractional prices and like a teenager sneaking back into the basement of their parents house to sleep just for the night, Buell used his old connections at Harley to sort of kinda sneak a few old forgotten XR1000 motors his way. It is here that we start to see the beginnings of that classic image of a sportster engine inside of a race bike built by Eric Buell. Because he took this cache of engines and designed a frame inspired by the RW750 to house the Harley power plant. He used his knowledge from building the RW to build a trellis frame. He used his knowledge from bikes like the FXR to create a rubber mount system to contain the large vibrations that a big Harley twin would produce. And he used his knowledge from Project Nova to combine that with a stress member engine format to save weight and eliminate down tubes. He also put the shock not in the usual spot behind the engine or even beside it because some bikes put the shock beside the engine. He put it under the engine and to centralize the mass of the bike. If you're like me and you have an interest in physics, you probably looked at this monstrosity and wondered, how would this exactly work in a traditional sense of compression? Well, it doesn't. See, when you hit a bump, the shock actually extends, not compresses. And when the wheel comes back down, the shock compresses, so it's all backwards. It was an opposite day. Also, the bike was super aerodynamic and had a fairing that basically covered, well, everything. <laughs> Buell called the bike the Buell Double R 1000. He sold 50 of them between 1987 and 1988. I don't know if I mentioned this yet, but yes, this run of bikes was actually 100% road illegal as this was Buell taking a stab at road bikes. <laughs> road bikes because this doesn't exactly scream commuter even though you threw some turn signals on it Ricky boy shortly after uh, this came along I wound up doing the prototype of the RR1000 uh, which was the uh, XR1000 powered uh, street bike street slash race bike which I built to try to fit in a class because there were 50 uh, I wanted to build a street bike so it couldn't be banned completely by the AMA but I still was interested in racing and there was a category we could build 50 of a 50 of a street bike would make you legal for the AMA the twins class at that time. So we built the R1000. There were only 47 engines left at Harley. They were left over 83 engines, actually. And uh, they were going to scrap them because of five years and five years after, they can throw them in the dumpster. So 88 was coming, and I'm like, well, instead of throwing them out, will you sell them to me? But they only had like 47, so I had to buy three from dealers to finish the 50 bikes. Anyway, with a nice chunk of change in his pockets from his new line of Harley-Davidson powered sport bikes, Buell had begun to return back into the eye of a few higher-ups at Harley and people who just really yearned for an American sport bike. As funny as it sounds, Mr. Buell was actually smuggled onto a cruise ship meant for Harley-Davidson higher-ups and associates to pitch the idea of Harley, once again, funding a sport bike range. The main idea was not to brand the bikes as Harley-Davidson's, but to brand them as something by Harley-Davidson which would naturally remove the risk of quote-unquote tainting the Harley brand. All sport bike tomfoolery will be handled by Buell at his company so long as, once again, Harley would provide financial, engineering, and branding support to Buell and his innovative and refreshing program. And so in 87, I was called in February of 87 to come to a meeting down at Harley um, with a small team of guys who said they wanted to build a road racing bike because Von Beals had been to Laguna Seca and seen that there were no Harleys there. And it was time to, why don't, why don't they do something about that? <coughs> so uh, those guys over the winter thought about it and they put a meeting together and they brought me in as a kind of a consultant. And in the meeting they were talking about um, taking an, X, an XR750 type engine, making it a 1,000 cc, um, putting in a five-speed transmission instead of a four-speed, you know, and going racing against this new superbike wheel, which is a 1,000 cc 750 four-cylinder 1,000cc twin. And I had read the rule books, and I'm kind of sitting in the meeting like, wait, wait, wait. You know, and they're like, we can make a mover modified chassis. I said, guys, don't do this. Build a water-cooled bike. So you could build a water-cooled 1,000cc four-stroke. It wouldn't just compete. It would dominate. Okay, look, <laughs> this is just part one. I'm not going to act like anyone doesn't know that HD took the deal. Duh. But what were the terms of the deal? Did Harley really want to take the deal? What bikes did Mr. Buell create after that? And we can see that this is the beginning of the rise of Buell, but what's the fall? And what's everything in between? Was Mr. Buell promptly arrested and charged for sneaking onto a private invite-only water vehicle? Will I ever own one of these cool-ass bikes? Make sure you come back in part two so we can find out. <laughs>